Hi everyone, here is the video for the 3.13 lesson, Wars End. While the Allies fought in North Africa and Italy and struggled to gain control of the shipping lanes of the Atlantic, American soldiers and sailors fought and died in the Pacific. The fighting was fierce and deadly as American Marines fought their way ashore on island after tropical island teeming with hot, humid jungles. With victories at Guadalcanal and in the Philippines, and at Iwo Jima and Okinawa, the Allies moved slowly toward their final goal, the home islands of Japan. On the home front, scientists worked to beat the enemy with new and terrifying technology. Goals for this lesson. Recognize the reasons for and effects of dropping atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Trace the progress and strategy of the war in the Pacific after 1942. And describe the U.S. position in the world at the end of World War II and the reasons for it. Don't forget to grab your reading guide and the lesson answer key and also this other sheet, the Allies Pacific Push. Okay, reading pages 300, 736 through 744. Reading guide, complete the Allies Pacific push sheet, read the chapter 32 highlights online, and the quiz at the end. So let's start on page 736. Allied victory in Europe. Throughout the summer and fall of 1944 and into the winter, the Allies closed in on Germany. The Soviets approached from the east and the British, Americans, and other forces from the west, and other forces from the west. German troops were fighting out to defend the fatherland. When forced to give ground, they blew up bridges and destroyed railroads to slow the Allied advance. On December 1944, Hitler made a desperate attempt to turn back the oncoming tide of troops. He ordered his generals to launch an assault on a thinly held American line in the Ardennes Forest in Belgium. Some 200,000 German soldiers and 600 tanks rammed into the Allied front. They caught the Americans by surprise and forced them back, creating a huge bulge in their lines. In the Battle of the Bulge, as the fight became to came to be known, 19,000 American troops were killed. The American line bent, but did not break. After two weeks of fighting, the Allies managed to rally and halt the German attack. Soon they were pushing forward again, smashing through German defenses. Bombers pounded Germany's industrial and commercial centers. American bombers by day, British by night, with no regard for civilian versus military casualties. The Allies bombed the city of Dresden, setting off a firestorm that could be seen 200 miles away. Bombs fall on Hamburg, Berlin, Cologne, Leipzig, and other cities, reducing block after block to rubble. As the Soviet army approached Warsaw, the Poles took, the, took heart and revolted against the German occupiers. They expected Soviet troops to come to their aid, but Stalin had plans to dominate Poland after the war. He held his army outside Warsaw and waited for the Germans to crush the revolt. Hitler's troops burned and dynamited most of the city. The Nazis killed as many as 250,000 Poles and sent hundreds of thousands more to concentration camps. Only then did the Soviet army move in to capture the ruins of Warsaw. The Poles would long remember this betrayal. In the spring of 1945, Americans advancing from the west and Soviets fighting from the east finally met at the Elbe River south of Berlin. They swapped rations and vodka, congratulating their colleagues in arms. Meanwhile, other Soviet troops closed in on Germany's capital, Berlin, where Adolf Hitler hid in a fortified bunker 50 feet underground. In desperation, he continued to issue impossible orders to units that no longer existed. Hitler knew that the Russians were pushing closer to his bunker. He also learned that his Axis partner, Mussolini, was dead, shot by his own people. Before the Russians could capture him, the Fuhrer sat on a table and shot himself with a pistol. Seven days later, on May 7, 1945, Germany surrendered. The Allies celebrated the next day as VE Day, Victory in Europe. In London, New York, Moscow, Paris, and cities throughout the world, people cried, hugged, and danced in the streets. Churchill called it the signal for the greatest outburst of joy in the history of mankind. The Allies' Pacific Push. Plug in my computer here. In the Pacific, after the Battle of Midway, the United States pursued a strategy of island hopping, moving toward Japan by taking one island at a time. On more than 100 Japanese-occupied islands, American troops fought their way ashore, often suffering heavy losses. The Americans realized they could not afford to fight for every Japanese-occupied island, so they leapfrogged some, bypassing the Japanese garrisons and leaving them, as one U.S. Admiral put it, to wither on the vine. At Guadalcanal, U.S. Marines decisively repelled Japanese forces. Superior American ground and air forces enabled the United States to rouse Japan's military and gain the upper hand in the wider battle to control the Solomon Islands. The fighting was fierce and gruesome, and the American public followed news accounts of the battles and shared word of victories of American forces. As the Americans closed in on Japan, Japanese flyers began to use a new form of air warfare, suicide attacks by pilots known as kamikaze, which means divine wind. 
Kamikazes turned their bomb-filled planes into weapons and deliberately crashed them into American vessels. By giving up his own life, a single kamikaze pilot could kill hundreds of Americans and destroy a whole ship. Japanese flyers launched a bold attack on U.S. forces attempting to retake the Philippine Islands. General Douglas MacArthur, who was the American commander in the Philippines at the start of the war, made good on his promise to return to the islands. He became the commander of the U.S. operations in the Pacific, and by late 1944, his forces were poised, poised to take back the Philippines. As the U.S. ships approached the islands, more than 400 kamikaze pilots flew out to meet them. They drove their planes straight at the American vessels, sinking and damaging several. But on October of 1944, MacArthur landed on the Philippine island of late. By by February, his troops were pressing into Manila to the cheers of both Filipinos and Allied civilians imprisoned in the city. U.S. troops continued to hop from island to island. After brutal fighting, they captured Iwo Jima, about 800 miles from Tokyo. They moved on to take Okinawa, a stepping stone to the major island of Japan, islands of Japan. On that small island, the Japanese lost more than 100,000 men and the Americans at least 12,000. Soon, American pilots were taking off from airstrips on the Pacific Islands and bombing Japan itself. These raids reduced Japan city, Japanese cities to ruins. Allied victory over Japan was no longer doubt, but the grim losses in taking each island had proven the Japanese were willing to fight to the last man. And before we move on to the Manhattan Project, I want to read this ex 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 excerpt here of the Code Talkers. More than 25,000 Native Americans served in the military during World War II, and thousands more worked in defense industries. In the Pacific, where the U.S. Marines were engaged in fierce fighting, a unit of some 400 Navajo code talkers provided communications vital to success. To keep its plans out of enemy hands, the military used codes, but standard codes could be broken. The complex, unwritten Navajo language provided the basis for a code the Japanese were never able to break. Because the Navajo language lacked words for tank, bomber, or the like, the toke Code talkers develop ingenious equivalents. For example, they use Lodzo, meaning whale, for battleship, Jeso, meaning buzzard, for bomber. One American officer said, Were it not for the Navajo code talkers, the Marines never would have taken Iwo Jima and other places. The Manhattan Project Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the popular American president who had led the United States through the Great Depression and most of World War II, was elected to an unprecedented fourth term. Roosevelt's spirit was as strong as ever, but his health had been poor. He died on April 12, 1945, at age 63. He was succeeded by his vice president, Harry S. Truman. Truman was soon faced one of the most difficult decisions a commander-in-chief would ever have to make. The decision had to do with ending the war in the Pacific. The strategy of island hopping had brought the Allies close to Japan. The next logical step would be to invade Japan itself. Some U.S. military officials predicted that a half a million American soldiers would die in an invasion of the Japanese homeland. Everyone agreed that even more Japanese would perish. But by the summer of 1945, American scientists pro pro offered President Truman an alternative. Even before the outbreak of the war, scientists had been exploring the structure of atoms and speculating about the possibility of splitting an atom's nucleus. They were building on the insights of Albert Einstein, a great German-born physicist. Einstein's revolutionary theories and his famous formula, E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, led scientists to understand the process of nuclear fission. Splitting the nucleus of an atom could set off a chain reaction capable of unleashing a huge amount of energy. Perhaps this energy could be used to light whole cities. Or perhaps it could be used to create a weapon, an atomic bomb of almost unimaginable destructive power. While Einstein did not have a bomb in mind when he developed his theories, he immediately understood when his fellow scientists explained their destructive potential. Other physicists had fled from fascist regimes in Europe and urged Einstein to put the matter before the president. In 1939, Einstein was living in the United States because he was of Jewish descent and no longer allowed to teach in German universities. He wrote to Franklin Roosevelt warning the president that the Nazis were already working to build an atomic bomb and urging that the United States do the same. Einstein and his fellow physicists believed the United States should hurry to develop an atomic bomb before Hitler because they knew that once Hitler had the bomb, he would not hesitate to use it. President Roosevelt authorized the start of a top-secret research program that grew to include eminent scientists from other allied nations. The program was codenamed the Manhattan Project. Led by the American scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer, the Manhattan Project's researchers set to work at secret locations across the country, even under a football stadium in Chicago. Eventually, some 120,000 men and women were working on the project. Their goal, to win the race to develop an atomic bomb. 
Six years and two billion after the Manhattan Project began, scientists successfully detonated an experimental atomic bomb at a remote location in the New Mexico desert. By this time, the Germans had surrendered and Hitler was dead. President Roosevelt, who had set the Manhattan Manhattan Project in motion was also dead. Harry Truman, the new president of the United States, had to decide if the United States would use the bomb against Japan. Dropping the bomb and victory in Japan. Truman, who had led troops in World War I, understood how costly the invasion of Japan would be. Japan's military leaders, recalling old samurai traditions that forbade surrender, were determined to continue the fight, even in the face of inevitable defeat. Japanese civilians had endured terrible punishment from U.S. bombers, but the nation showed no signs of giving in. Japanese workers built tunnels where people could take refuge when bombs fell, and housewives trained to fight invaders with bamboo spears. Japanese soldiers and civilians alike prepared themselves with the slogan, A hundred million will die together for the emperor and the nation. Truman concluded that dropping an atomic bomb in Japan could bring the war in the Pacific to a swift end. Some American officials and even some scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project opposed the idea of using the bomb. They believed the Allies could defeat Japan without using such a terrible weapon. Truman knew that dropping an atomic bomb would kill thousands of Japanese civilians and cause horrific destruction, but he believed that it would cost far fewer lives, Japanese and American, than an invasion of Japan. He wrote a short note to his Secretary of War, Release when ready, but not sooner than August 2nd. On August 6, 1945, an American pilot steered his B-29 bomber, the Enola Gay, toward the Japanese port of Hiroshima. A single atomic bomb sat on board the plane. It looked like a long, black trash can with fins, but it contained the equivalent of 15,000 tons of dynamite. Once over Hiroshima, the pilot dropped the bomb and turned for home. A brilliant flash gave way to a huge mushroom cloud that bloomed over the city. The explosion unleashed an expanding fireball that flattened five miles of downtown Hiroshima and instantly killed almost 80,000 civilians. The nuclear blast left many more people maimed or hideously burned, while others fell victim to a new, more gradual killer, radiation poisoning. The Japanese government did not surrender. Three days later, another U.S. plane dropped a second atomic bomb in the city of Nagasaki, destroying the heart of the city and killing or injuring another 80,000 people. On August 15, Jap Jap Japan's Emperor Hirohito addressed his people by radio. Japanese civilians listened to the broadcast with heads bowed and tears in their eyes. It was the first time they ever heard their emperor's voice. He announced that his government had agreed to unconditional surrender. The surrender ceremony took place on, in Tokyo Bay aboard the battleship Missouri, the flagship of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. General MacArthur stood on the ship's deck and watched as Japanese officials signed the official surrender. The signers for all the Allied nations that had fought the Japanese... Oh, I missed some of that sentence. Let me go back. And here's a picture of Hiroshima after the dropping of the bomb. The signers for... All the Allied nations that had fought the Japanese gathered behind him. The war was finally over. In Allied nations around the world, exuberant crowds celebrated VJ Day, Victory in Japan Day. In New York City, two million people flooded into Times Square where soldiers and sailors embraced passing young women in what one serviceman called the kissingest day in history. In Pearl Harbor, flares and searchlights illuminated the night sky as U.S. sailors cried tears of joy at the thought that they could finally go home. Yet behind the celebration stood the, all the horror of the last six years. All right, let's go back here a little bit. I wanted to look at the excerpt about Einstein. Einstein's appeal to FDR. And I'm not going to read the actual letter. I'm just going to read the introduction to the letter that Einstein wrote to President Roosevelt. In 1905, the German-born scientist Albert Einstein published a series of studies in which he proposed his theory of relativity relativity and revolutionized modern physics. In 1921, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. Although Einstein headed a major research institute in Berlin, the Nazis denounced his work as Jewish physics. In 1932, Einstein left Germany, never to return. He joined the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, and became an American citizen. In the 1930s, German scientists, building on the revelations of Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, showed that splitting an uranium atom resulted in the release of extraordinary amounts of energy. Einstein was horrified that his insights might be turned into a massively destructive weapon. Some scientists in the United States, including other physicists who had fled from fascist regimes in Europe, worried that the Germans now had a head start on building an atomic bomb. They asked Einstein, who had enormous prestige, to bring the issue to Franklin Roosevelt's attention. In 1939, Einstein sent a letter to Roosevelt telling him about the potential for such a weapon and urging the United States quickly began experimental work to develop it before the Germans. The president authored research 
authorized research that led to the Manhattan Project, which developed the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. While Einstein's colleagues worked on the Manhattan Project, Einstein himself did not. Because Einstein had actively supported pacifist and socialist causes, the U.S. government officials did not trust him enough to involve him in a top-secret project. And then the rest of this, um, the insert is just...